Right, so this is lecture number three. Uh, today we are going to learn about site assessment. Um, site assessment means you now the part of this class is to, to design a solution for a contaminated site. Well, um, there are many sites where you may not even know the extent of contamination. So the solution you should, um, you should uh, project or the solutions that you should come up with should be also aligned with the extent of contaminations. So the first goal of any, any remediation to understand how it, the extent of contamination occur at a site. So how do you know those? How do you assess those contamination is what the, this class is about. So I wanted to also uh, just quickly remind you that if you have not joined Campusware, I know that three or four students have not joined. Uh, please join that because it's important for your discussions and communications related to class. And then um, uh, I know that by today we'll, we'll have to form a group, but I extend that for another, another two days uh, because I'm going to share some last year projects title as well as abstract so that you know uh, what kind of project you are interested in. Um, so uh, by next class, you should have your group because I know that project topic is due on 21st. Uh, I wanted to make sure you have at least, uh, at least seven days a week uh, within your group to discuss a topic. And again, this project topic doesn't mean that this is final. It means that you have discussed and you have suggested a topic uh, with a little bit of scope. That way I can discuss with you and you can change the topic uh, after a discussion if you want to. Uh, but you have to first discuss the topic with your group by next week. And more importantly, next class we have quiz. Uh, again, this is not in class quiz. This will be open book and uh, uh, it will be released after the end of the class. So that means we have 24 hours to answer those quiz questions. And again, um, the two minutes for questions. So based on the, the quiz question can vary. It could be five questions or it could be 10 questions or within that. Uh, so that's why I say that two minutes for uh, two minutes for question. So you get two minutes for question. So that means once you open the quiz, you have to take the quiz. You can't really stop it in between. Um, but um, it is 24 hours, it's an open book, and you have to take within 24 hours um, from tomorrow, or from the Thursday class. So by Friday, 4 p.m., you have to take the quiz. Um, but you have to also account for how long it will take. Maybe it will take, if it's 10 questions, I'll let you know when I release the quiz, how many questions. So you know you have to account for that much time um, before the deadline. Again, these are conceptual questions. We have some examples already. You did it last class. We'll also have more examples. And the quiz on quiz one would be everything lecture one, two, and three. It means uh, um, everything until today's class. And homework due next class. Um, upload that on GradeScope. Um, should be easy. Again, we are not grading the homework for uh, completely accuracy. We are just looking for your effort as well as your approach. So there is no reason for you to uh, delay the homework. And the first homework is pretty easy because uh, it's pretty open-ended answers. All right, so as I said, um, I want to share with you some of the projects that we have, at least in our last year uh, students did, uh, so that you have some idea of uh, how to pick a project. So I have to give you like, you know, there are five different ways you can pick a topic. Number one is, which is kind of popular in many, um, in last three years, is site specific project. I Means you already know a contaminated site and you wanted to think of what's the way remediation method that you wanted to approach. Uh, so how do you find a site? Well, if you look for super fun, if you search super fun site, super fun site means highly polluted site. Um, and if the list are given on EPA website. So if you search Superfund sites, you'll get lots of Superfund sites in California. In fact, LA County is the most, um, you know, the LA County is the, the number one county in terms of the maximum number of Superfund site. Um, so that's why you can look for Superfund site in LA County and you can pick any of them. And you'll find what kind of pollutants they have, they have assessment, and then you can do an alternative design to, uh, to treat that site. So, source Superfund sites in LA. 
or in California. Again, it doesn't have to be California. It doesn't have to be in, in the United States. It can be any any place in the world. Um, any contaminated site that you see on news, you got to have some information about the site. So that's the reason uh, you have to look for those polluted sites. So a good way to do it is uh, look for news channels and news articles related to polluted site. And you'll find some news and then dig deeper and see if you have enough information about the site. Enough means you should know the extent of pollutions there. Uh, there should be, uh, you should know what kind of pollutants are there, uh, what soil type, and I'll tell you how to determine soil type. But at least you have to have a news or some articles on somewhere uh, so that you have information. So this is realistic project. The second one is a pollutant specific project. Means uh, you might have you know, heard news that this pollutant is found in water. Uh, so there are concerns related to specific pollutant group or class. And if you are interested in this particular pollutant, you can also do um, um, projects related to pollutants. And there you don't have a site. Uh, what you'll do is you'll uh, look for different methods to remove pollutants uh, or treat polluted water or polluted soil. Uh, so then you, uh, it's not specific to site. Again, example is PFAS. PFAS is a group of pollutants which are in news a lot of uh, in a lot of sites. You could think of those. Uh, so again, search in news, polluted water. What is found? Lead is another pollutant. So you know that Flint has lead pollutions, and many many big cities has lead pollutions. Uh, so you want to know how to design those system. For instance, you know many of the pipes or the um, uh, many pipes that supply water to our home is uh, polluted with lead because the old, uh, old infrastructure has a, uh, this uh, lead, um, lead sealant. Uh, so that's why you know, you've got to think of how you can address those concerns. That's another project. Then the third one is a treatment technology. Okay, so if you, if you think of, um, there are many different bioremediation is one, anaerobic digestion is another, uh, advanced oxidation is one type of treatment technology. Um, phytoremediation is one type of treatment technology. So you can think of many, many different technology that is used uh, to, for different solutions. So if you know any treatment technology or just look on uh, our syllabus, you have some list of them. And if you want to do research on that specific one, uh, then you can use it. For instance, landfill, how to design a landfill uh, for a certain type of uh, pollutant, all that how to design a landfill for energy, um, energy harvest, that's another one. So that's a treatment technology specific. And the fourth one is related to any news uh, or any current issues. For instance, if you, you might heard that electronic waste is a big problem. So how to manage electronic waste? How to manage plastic waste? Uh, another uh, is uh, energy. Every coal ash is still at the biggest uh, waste that we produce because uh, nearly 40 or 50% of our energy is coming from coal in many other places. California doesn't have coal, uh, but other places do have. Um, do, um, um, so that means you know when you use coals for energy harvest, you produce this ash, high amount of ash. Those ash has a lot of pollutants. So how do we manage those? So again, I just want you to read lots of news, search, environmental pollutions and you get lots of news and then you have some ideas. Again, this class is a student centric interest. So that means your interest will be your project. I don't want to impose a, a particular types of projects. So that's why I didn't really uh, write before on this. But anyway, these are the different steps you can use. Choice five, again, doesn't mean that everything has to be within those choice one, two, three, four. You may have some interest to so share with me you know, what particular type of work you want to do, uh, then we can align that with you. For instance, you may have particular interest in if you are in want to commit uh, your career for environmental engineering, you might have some, um, some particular interest in certain areas. For instance, how to, how to make a home more energy efficient. That's just one, one example. Uh, so that's also related to sustainability. It doesn't have to be, you know, because every house produce waste, uh, greenhouse gas, um, domestic waste, and many other materials this is in, in, uh, in home. So you have to think, connect all that and come up with a story or at least a thought. And then we can discuss that, how we can make it a class project. 
So again, uh, think of all that and share different ideas online on, on campus where uh, it may not be a project, but if you throw like 10 different sentence or title, potential title or, so, or scope, some you might find that some other students are interested in the same topic. And whichever has more students interest, you, know, you can pick that. So this is just examples. So I, I wrote title and abstract from the final project. Uh, so I am not going to go through this one, but I just going to show that um, the titles are catchy because we want them to pay attention. The whole idea is you write a project such a way that if you write that titles and abstract, it will be picked up by news channel because they think this is interesting. You will not write something so academic that people don't, don't want to read. So I encourage people to come up with a title that uh, that is newsworthy. So maybe you know the abstract everything is much more scientific and uh, in the sense is more academic, but titles are a little bit catchy. And that that was in tenth month. So this particular one is think of this title here in Persian, tackling El Monte PC last groundwater. So El Monte is a location in Southern California near uh, San Gabriel Valley. That's the location has a lot of these PC pollutions. So they were interested in how to design this uh, different remediation method to treat groundwater. So that's just one example. Again, you, you can read those in your slides. Uh, these are all available on CCLE, so you don't have to go through all that together. I just want to give example here. Second one about landfills. Uh, so basically how to make landfill which can produce energy. So that was the scope here in this particular one. There is another um, another project where they, they were interested in designing anaerobic digester or, or uh, evaluating how anaerobic digester could be helpful in turning LA organic waste into energy solutions. Because LA, like any big cities, have lots of organics because restaurants, foods are wasted. Um, most of the grocery, you know, if you think of uh, Safeway, uh, the, not Safeway, um, um, Ralph, Ralph every week, they dump lots of waste because once the there is a cell life, means you know, once they put some item displayed on the cell, they have to replace it, you know, where they go, you know. Most of the time, if they're there for a long time, they have to throw it out, even though they are perfectly fine food. Uh, so they are also a par part of initiative where they could, uh, they are taking it to, uh, to a particular location because every time they deliver this, uh, uh, a truck with all the wood, lot the goods. They they don't want to send the empty truck back, you know. So they they take all this waste and use that same truck to deliver that uh, waste into another energy facility site where they produce energy using anaerobic digester uh, from this waste. Uh, so again, these are different way of uh, managing energy and waste together. So this was one of the problem. Then sec another project was who would, clean, uh, who would clean up the mess from a dry cleaner in Texas. Engineers seek help from tiny microorganisms. So as you see the title, they are looking for a particular site, dry cleaner site at uh, Texas, which was polluted with obviously solvent, uh, Dean Apple. Um, and uh, they are looking for how to use microbioremediations to treat that site. Um, another one is Bristol Bay Salmon. So, uh, so that's basically Alaska. If you know, if you heard about the news, um, they are trying to open a copper mine in Alaska, which will produce lots of waste and that inevitably pollute the water. And that particular war has a lot of ecological implications because uh, the salmon, most of the salmon over there uh, use that sites for uh, breeding. So that means if you pollute it, you are going to kill that entire populations of salmon. Uh, so that was another project. Again, uh, these are all based on news channel articles. Uh, so students look for articles and then something catches their attention and they use that as a project. Um, another one to think about here is a Tianjin, um, Tianjin uh, warehouse explosion. There was a big chemical factory was explosion occurs in 2015. In China, and uh, it was such huge that you know destroy several apartments, and they are looking for how far the extent of pollution can be, and what method they can use to minimize the uh, pollution in long term. 
Um, again, this is another example with uh, California, which uh, that's related to Omega Chemical Corporation, which was operational in uh, until 1990s, and they produced lots of uh, this uh, um, uh, the solvent, which we are um, which are in the part of the groundwater pollution sites. As you see, this is a Superfund site. Uh, so if you search Superfund sites in California, you'll find lots of them. Uh, so that means you know you can pick any of those sites and and, and uh, think of way to actually remediate to remediate that site. Uh, this is another type of you know domestic waste, cultivating a garden with leftover food. That means you know, the idea here is that any kind of green waste that you produce at home, you can uh, make compost out of it and and then use that to fertilize your garden soil. So that is another. Um, another project. So again, this is just a one year of uh, uh, projects. There are last year examples, the, but this will give you ex enough idea of how to find a project. Any question? Or any particular projects that you are thinking of and not sure yet, you can share now, we can discuss just one example. Um, I have a question. Okay. So last class we talked about, we learned about how paper is like the largest like waste item. So what are technologies that are being used to like either like reuse that paper just to, or how is it being diverted? Yeah, you, I mean, that could be, is this a question you need answer? Or is this a question you are thinking whether it can be a project or not? Um, well, if you want to keep it as a project, that's fine. You know, this is this is a this is a first thing is how how it is being managed. Um, I think the the big you know I I'm not expert in the in that particular area, but at least you know um, what I know, know so far is most of the papers are wasted because they are mixed with other foods and other stuffs. Then you can't really use it. Uh, so that's just the how to manage those as the first place. Source separation is the biggest challenge. Um, because that could save it, uh, save a lot of paper. And second is, let's say you, everybody did that. And then you assume that all papers are separated from other source. Now, how do you, what different technology use to, uh, to reuse them or uh, how you can use, make a different products out of it. Uh, that could be another angle and, or it could be make combination of uh, three of them. And there is another thing is paper is always also not renewable all the time in the sense it, it takes long time for a tree to grow. It takes only, you know, if you think of uh, every time you use a napkin, that tree, you know, it takes like many years to grow. So how long it takes for us to use that? Fraction of second. Uh, so that's why, you know, there is a time gap. So there are new technology about how to develop materials uh, not from trees, but from some highly growth object, for instance, fungi. Every time if you think of, uh, if you leave a food in home in your, uh, and let it um, waste, you see the fungi grow very quickly, right? So fungi are known to grow very fast if you give them the right conditions or fungals or fungus and all that. So that means there are new technology where people are actually growing fungi to create the packing materials. So that's just another way. You know? So, so you just have to think of different solutions, just search online. You don't have to have any knowledge on it. As long as you have interest, we can develop that projects. As I said, we'll work together on it. So it's not like you are doing on your own, everything. Um, your goal is just to find that, pro find that interest. Okay. Yeah, start sharing all those in, on campus where that way we can discuss everything like these questions you can ask and I'll give you some input, some suggestions, and then you, that's how we get to the final projects or at least the title. All right, so <clears throat> let's start the, this particular class objectives. All right, so that's um, 
Now I share my screen. So a class objective is to learn how to assess a contamination potential or extent of contamination after a spill at a particular site. So it's not like we are doing extensive um, assessment, but the idea of how the assessment is done is what we are going to learn today. And uh, what you are going to learn is that um, each well, you might have idea of what type of pollutants at that site because a spill occur at that site. That means you know what kind of spill that was, or maybe the industry that was there. For instance, if there is a pollution near near a gas station, you know what kind of contaminant you expect because that's in the gasoline. Uh, same thing if it is a dry, um, it's a dry cleaner facility. You know what kind of chemicals they use. So that means you already know what pollutant to expect. Uh, let me give a second. There is a noise here. Right, sorry about that. Um, so um, you'll, uh, you'll get an idea of you now, if you know the pollutant, how you are going to um, predict whether this is going to be a warp, a pollution in water or soil or in air. So that's the first thing you'll understand. And then mostly we'll cover related to pollutions in soil or water because everything in air is going to evaporate in some time. So it's very hard to contain. So what's the, what the contamination usually stay long time in either in water or in soil. So you learn more about that particular topic, at least in how much pollutant absorb in soil and how do you understand that? So that's the objective. The first thing is how to characterize a site, how people do the site characterization. So I'll just go through very quickly on this one. Um, this particular, um, uh, let me see if I can click on this one. Um, if not, let's see if I can. Use the. Oh, uh, this is a. Or claims developers in Polk County failed to notify thousands of new homeowners that they are living on contaminated land. And this lawsuit claims that the developer of the Polk County property, the Drummond Company, knew about high radiation levels dating as far back as 1978. It also says the feds informed Florida's governor about elevated radiation levels on that land. And according to Target 8 senior investigator Steve Andrews, it was all kept quiet. Yeah, you know, this lawsuit claims that politicians and the phosphate mining industry worked to keep the lid on the EPA's findings. Uh, the litigation is filed on behalf of people who own property or live in the Oak Ridge and Grasslands subdivisions in Lakeland. Now, Grasslands is a premier golf community with upscale housing right next door, Lakeside Village, a major retail center. The area used to be known as the Poseidon Mine. It was purchased by the Drummond Company in 1978. In 1982, Drummond ceased mining operations and began to reclaim the area and develop 1,400 acres. The lawsuit claims no one, including Drummond, notified the plaintiff or class members of the significantly elevated cancer risks posed by the presence of radon gas, gamma radiation, or concerns raised by the federal EPA. It goes on to say, in 1975, the EPA administrator informed the governor of Florida that the EPA had found elevated levels of radiation in buildings constructed on land reclaimed from phosphate mining areas and recommended that construction of new buildings on phosphate mining lands be discouraged. According to the lawsuit, EPA tests before development of Oak Ridge showed radiation levels 11 to 21 times higher than the acceptable risk limit. Exposure to levels of radiation similar to that identified in Oak Ridge development translates to residents receiving more than one chest x-ray per week. I mean, that's a lot. It's a, it's a lot, it's alarming. And then, again, this is all just breaking, so yeah. we're, we're getting into it right now, but what about illnesses, cancer, race, that sort of thing? 
We don't know about any of that at this point. The lawsuit seeks compensation for loss of property value right now for cleanup and to initiate medical monitoring for residents. I reached out to the drumming company this afternoon and I was told that there was no one available to comment on this particular litigation. Mm, but we're going to stay on and add more tonight at 11. On this. 11 yep. Thank you, Steve. Sure. All right, so um, that one gave an idea of that particular site, which was um, a previously uh, reclaimed site because it was mine. And uh, because of mining, they produce lots of ore, phosphate ore, which has also radiations. So they found that, you know, the amount of radiations people are exposed there is more than, uh, it's almost like every week you are getting a chest X-ray. Uh, so it's a lot of radiations if you are living there. And now question is, Number one, number first thing is before even you sue somebody or not, what you can do about it. Now that's exactly what we are gonna do in this class. Is uh, imagine there is a site with a lot of pollutions, how do you treat them? What's the best and effective way to treat it? So this is just one example. Now, so now you see this particular site, you have a few people over here, this is a golf course. Uh, you have to make assessment based on the, what's the radiation source and where is it and how far it is from the site and um, how do you capture that radiations? And how do you remove that particular source? And where to look for those? So that means you have to have an idea of the history of the site. You have to know where the mines were and uh, what they did, how they, how they dump all their waste, where their waste are dumped, how do they cover the entire site, all that factor you got to know. So that's why you know, every time you think of uh, waste management or the assessment, you got to think of all that different uh, factors. So this is just another example. Imagine somebody just call you and say that I have groundwater pollutions at some site, they found pollutants. And you got to know the source. So this, I gave you two examples. Uh, one is, you know, this is, is an underground uh, gasoline storage container. This is what happens for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for, you know, gasoline storage. If you think of any gas station, they have this big tank inside. So those tank, if leaks, then obviously you have this petroleum going in. And then you have another site, which is dry cleaner facilities. And they also use lots of solvent. The whole idea of dry cleaning, if you search it, it's not dry cleaning, it's just, it doesn't use water. They use solvent, chemicals. And the idea here is that, you know, if you, uh, those chemicals, then, you know, that, that whole process will be more efficient and the, the cotton doesn't get destroyed. Um, the process, the way it works. So that means those solvent might also leak or if they are not, don't have a proper containment system, those uh, solvent will leak over here. And as you see the, the biggest difference between these two, can you see any point of difference based on how you see the plume? What do you see the difference between those two? So the plume on the left is more constrained to the top of the water table. Okay. While the plume on the right uh, goes deeper into into the aquifer. Exactly. So, wh what do you think? Or that's the right um, right answer. But let's see. You know, what could be the reason? Any the difference guess? in density. Difference in density. So. The, if you see the organic pollutants, their molecular weight could be very different. So, you know, they could be lighter than water or they could be heavier than water. So uh, water molecule, if you think of H2O, it's 18, oxygen is two. So you think 18 gram per liter, um, no, no, gram per mole. So if you think of density, that's uh, one gram per ml, okay? So if you take one ml of water, that's way one gram. But if you're some solvent like oil float on water because they are lighter than water, if you think of density. But some oils are heavier than water. So that means if you put them there, it's going to sink. So they, that's why they call you know, bean apples. Uh, so that's a denser, you know. So that means it's much denser than uh, water. Uh, so, so that's why, you know, you, you got to think of you know what the density. If the density is high, that means if you are cleaning, if you if you do assessment here and you if you dig a groundwater or the monitoring well, you don't have to go deeper. 
if you take in the near the near the table, you get most accurate reading. But imagine if you're doing it here the same way, if you have a well over here, and then, um, then you might find this one is not polluted because you know you say that okay look there is no pollutions and then you say that this site doesn't really have any pollutions uh, but because you are looking for a wrong place you are looking for a uh, you will get a wrong answers because the dense density is higher you might have to dig much deeper so then only you can detect it so these decisions all depends on the type of pollutants and all these uh, background knowledge so that's why you know if you pick a site, you have to think of what pollutants are there, and that's how you design or at least the assessment study. So first thing you know, uh, imagine you you find a site. What you do is a, it's called desktop study. That means everything you want to look for, uh, you do right in your computer. Uh, so that what you do is you go to Google Map, and then look for what site it is, where the locations, what's the surrounding look like. Is this a urban area or is this a rural area? What kind of uh, plants? You know, it, most important, you look for is there any water source? The reason is your protection of water source is more important than anything else because um, it will be exposed around. So that means you are looking for, for instance, here there is a river. That's the most important part of your um, assessment study because you want to protect them. Then also you have to look for nearest um, uh, nearest. Um, um, infrastructure, for instance, where is the road, where is a house, and where the what's the slope, where water moves, what kind of rainfall it receives per year, because that determines how much pollutant can migrate downward or it can be washed away, and what kind of soil it is. So we'll I'll help you how to find those informations. Uh, these are all online available. As long as you know the zip code or even uh, location GPS coordinate, you'll be able to find what soil. Uh, that particular coordinate has, particularly if it is from US, and also uh, the amount of rainfall you receive in that area. So these are the different things you can find out. And then you have to also create a boundary. What kind of, um, you have to uh, provide a perimeter where you are going to look for all these informations, because you have to define the boundary uh, for that site. For instance, if the spill occur at a site, you have to look for what's the up, uh, up gradient and down gradients because water moves from high elevation to low elevations. So that means you have to take more sample in the down elevations to know the extent of the pollutions. You don't have to go upstream much more distance. So these are the, these are the understanding you have to think of uh, when you, um, when you uh, pick a site. So that's why I wrote all the list. Uh, so if you design a project, these are the steps you have to look for um, uh, in your uh, site assessment in that paragraph. For instance, topo topography, uh, presence of surface water, pond, lake, wetland, anything nearby, how far it there from here, uh, any groundwater um, depth, how far below um, the ground we have groundwater and which direction is moving. So all that factors are important because you want to look for the extent of pollu pollutions. Once you do that one, so that's basically, um, this is the, then the third one, is sampling and analysis plan. Because now that you have understood, you will make a sampling plan. This is obviously imaginary. You will not go out there and walk and uh, do it all that. Um, imagine it's a real project. You have to make a sampling plan, means you have to think of what to samples to understand or confirm the extent of pollutions. You have three choice. You can take air samples. You can take water samples. You can also take uh, soil samples. And, but air samples, if the pollutants are um, uh, volatile, and if it is like contamination occur very recently, because if contamination occur very long time ago, most of the air will be already diluted, unless it's a continuous source. So that's the first thing you have to think of, where you to take samples. Uh, once you decide, let's say water samples and soil samples, you have to now pick up locations because you can't take everywhere, it's not feasible. You have to take most probable locations, which has which will give you idea about extent of pollutions. Like I said, you don't take many samples in upstream, you take more samples in downstream because that's where water moves. That means most of the pollutants will have migrated to that direction. And how far you go downstream, it depends on uh, how many uh, years after the pollutions you are taking samples, 
what kind of site characteristic, how much rainfall it receive, uh, all that factors, because you have to first assume that the pollutants migrated certain distance. And that assumption based on some parameters. Uh, so we'll learn that in this class today. And once you have those samples taken, you'll do all the laboratory analysis and uh, do assessment. <clears throat> and the second, as I said, you go to the field and do all that kind of site investigations. Uh, first thing you have to do is if you, if you work in a company like that, you have to take this particular training. It's a 40 hour training course. You can take that training without being associated with a company or not. This is required. Uh, this is required for you to, uh, to visit any sites which has pollutions. And then you have to wear right kind of um, mask. Um, uh, if it is, let's say, volatile organic pollutant, you have to have a mask that filter the contaminants like you see in this left side, because uh, you're taking um, volatile pollutants. And then you have to also assess the site properties, like where, how far the groundwater depth, and also um, the soil properties. Most of the time, uh, before you used to take soil samples to do that, nowadays you have remote sensing um, method. You have also the uh, geophysical method where you scan it and then you get a data. So that's exactly what you see over here. Um, this person was just uh, uh, using uh, ultrasound techniques to, um, or sonar techniques to, uh, to examine the soil porosity and soil heterogeneity. And again, you also mark all the utilities so that you, when, if you dig anything, you don't really destroy that particular utility mark. So these are all things you are going to learn uh, or uh, learn how to do it um, if you work in this kind of uh, project. Uh, but again, you are not going to write those in your project because you're not doing it actually. But at least you write what was the assignment step would look like. And once you do that one, you have to take samples, soil samples, you have to decide how much soil samples. You have to also decide what depth you are going to take samples because that's again the example I send you uh, that basically shows where the extent of pollution can occur. Uh, so you have to have some idea before that. You will do some kind of rough calculations to understand that. And then groundwater sampling. You have to have a groundwater well, monitoring well. Basically you have a borehole and then you uh, take water samples using a pipe and pump. And uh, you could also do some kind of air sampling. If the soil is polluted with volatile organic pollutants, you put the sampler there and collect samples. And once you have all the sampling and then you do interpret data. So that's the final step where you write the report, interpret data and tell your client how much extent of pollution uh, so that you can decide what kind of treatment method you have. Um, so again, once you have all that aspect is done, um, you do all these analysis, you do source assessment, uh, where is the source, how much of the source remaining, what kind of hazardous material found in the source. Once you do that one, you'll, you'll do assessment, fate and transport, means how far the pollutant already have migrated uh, from that particular site. Um, then you do exposure predictions, means at that example I show you, um, they have to, uh, exposure prediction means how much pollutant they'll expose for, for daily basis. Like they said in that example, the amount of radiation is almost like a week, uh, at least one uh, once a week of uh, X-ray radiations, uh, chest X-ray radiations, uh, which is a lot. That means um, that's how you can predict them. And once you do that one, you do uh, health and safety analysis. For instance, uh, what kind of risk you'll have, uh, what kind of disease you might have, you know, based on that radiations. What kind of other effects on is this going to affect your groundwater? Is this going to affect your uh, air? Or is this going to affect the plants that grow on that particular soil? All that factors. Uh, so again, these all different things will not be done by one person. That's why I said um, this uh, hazardous waste remediation or assessment is done by many different uh, disciplines. Then you look for adverse impact and do on uncertainty analysis because there is always an error associated with your measurements and because you are guessing a lot. And then you do compare the results and then you write the report. So that's basically the assessment aspect. Like I said, um, the very first thing is to understand the source. How do you know the source? Again, 
you know the source based on the industry. If you if somebody reported, you have to find out what's the known pollutant you might find. In that particular case, it was a mine. So you have to think of all that first. Once you think of, you decide what mine it was, then you look for what kind of pollutant you expect in those kind of mines. And then those pollutants, all you're concerned about is that 167.73, the least um, uh, priority list, NPL, uh, national priority list of pollutants. These are the pollutants. I'll just write national priority list. Okay. Uh, so this is the pollutants you are looking for. So usually these are the things you usually expect, usual suspect you look for. So those are written here, you know, organic pollutants, heavy metals, all that other aspect. I also share the handout, reading assignment, chapter three, um, for assessment, you might find those uh, um, pollutants there. I think it, it was shared last, last week. Um, so these are some organic, uh, some of the heavy metal pollutants, lead, iron, copper, all that factors you should look for. And then also you might look for what kind of uh, other source. For instance, here, as I say, if, if there are any, any fire activities, if there were fire activity, you'll find this fluorinated organic pollutants because those are the fire extinguishing chemicals used or firefighting foam was used in many sites. And if it is like a, a dry cleaner, then there are organic solvent. So again, these are all things you have to guess before you start using those. Um, assessment. And then there are also um, pollutant associated with, um, associated with burning. Let's say there is a wildfire. You may expect a lot of pH because pH is naturally formed when you burn any biomass. And if there is petroleum, you might find BTEX. Uh, so these are the things, you know, um, to look for. So again, if you when you do analysis, you have to also understand or tell the analytical lab what to look for. So this is how we can predict. Um, once you um, once you determine, um, then you uh, you have to also, as I said, the second one is the pattern transport. You have to predict. That means you have to predict whether this is going to be in air, or in water, or in soil. As I said, this prediction is based on thermodynamic constants or, or the um, other types of uh, pollutant they may find there. Uh, so that's why um, we'll learn that process. There is a question. In other environmental regulatory agency in the world, do they have greater list of priority contaminants? Uh, for example, in comparing to US, the U is comparatively more stringent on chemical regulations. You're right. Um, I think the list are kind of uh, similar between Europe and US. The difference in the is the limit. Uh, in Europe, some chemicals are banned. In US, it's not. For instance, think of asbestos. Asbestos cause cancer. We know that it's caused cancer. Many years of research. Uh, still, many uh, US, it's not completely banned. Uh, that means you people can still use it in many products. It's not. I mean, if they're discouraged. Um, but there are still some products or company they use asbestos in some some form or other. Um, uh, the reason they is not banned is a political issues, you know, because there are many industry who uh, they get a lot of money on that. They lobby heavily on this, so they are not using asbestos in traditional materials like pipes, uh, but they are using some other product. But in Europe, it's completely banned, uh, or at least in many of the uh, in in many of the countries. Uh, so that, uh, yes, you're right, uh, Europe has more stringent regulations, but the list of pollutants are kind of the uh, same. All right, so the first thing you're going to learn is the pattern transport. As I said, it can go to air, it can go to soil, or it can go to um, go to water. Uh, but most of the pollutants are not always persistent. That means, you know, once they are released into environment, they're not going to stay the same. They may degrade naturally. And there are many processes that can be removed, that can remove the pollutants. For instance, I gave example, a couple of them. Number one, uh, photolysis. Photolysis means um, if the, the, the pollutants are exposed to sunlight, uh, sunlight has UV rays and that can degrade a lot of pollutants. 
So that means you know, if, you, if you have a pollutant spill in lake water or river water, uh, you might expect that if it's sensitive to radiations or the solar sunlight, you might see that pollutant decrease over time. So that means you have to account for how fast that pollutant will degrade because of photolysis. So that's, uh, so that's like say K photolysis. This is the rate, okay? If you know the rate, you'll be able to predict how much, um, hold on, this is a typo here, right? Okay, so same thing, you, you can look for hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means uh, water is itself is gonna react. Water has H plus and OH minus. So they may also react with that pollutants and degrade it. For instance, if you release lead, lead can undergo hydrolysis means lead I'm just put, putting a number here. Lead can react with OH and it can precipitate. Um, okay, so that's precipitations. Uh, it could also react with a high organic pollutant. Similarly, it can react with OH minus. I'm just going to say R. R is organic. So they can transform to something else. So that means you have to also predict that. Otherwise, you will not know what happens there. There is another is dissolutions by degradations. So these are all different processes. So you got to have some understanding of the fundamental chemical process that occur at that site. So in this class, we'll learn a little bit fundamentals, but then we'll mostly apply that in that particular um, process to design a remediation scheme. And again, in C-153, you already know what is a um, sorption, what is a, uh, to some extent, um, um, Henry constant, how to use Henry constant. So, but we are gonna apply that again. Um, and also I want to suggest that if you, if you don't know, um, um, that uh, you didn't take the C-153, that class is always online from last, last class you now. It is on YouTube. Um, you can find it in the same channel, but if you don't find it, let me know. I can send that link. Um, that way you can go to specific uh, lectures if it is not clear in this particular lecture, because I skimmed through those very quickly here. All right, so now that you know how to predict the fate and transport based on the properties. Again, this is all um, repeat of what we learned. I just want to reiterate that any chem organic pollutants, you should look for the functional group. Because that functional group tell you uh, whether this is going to be soluble or not, or going to be volatile, or going to react with. So these are the things that we cover in the last class. I just want to highlight those. Uh, so again, why it is important? If it has functional group, it becomes, makes it more easy to uh, form hydrogen bond. And hydrogen bond means you, know, you have an electronegative Oxygen is highly electronegative compared to hydrogen. So when they form one, this become a little bit positive and this become a little bit negative because electron cloud shift towards the oxygen atom. So what it does is that means if you have another wedge, this edge will react towards oxygen. This oxygen will react towards this hydrogen. So that means they will align it certain way and they hold each other tightly. They hold each other tightly. That means very easy to uh, let them escape out of each other. That that's the reason when you have hydrogen bonding, that liquid is not going to evaporate because that that molecule is bound to another chemical, in the same chemical in hydrogen bond. Um, so um, that means any organic chemicals with the functional group that can form hydrogen bonding will have less volatile nature. And obviously, between a uh, functional group, it depends. Some are more, more, uh, more likely to form hydrogen bond or strong hydrogen bond than other. So that's why I wrote here: carboxylic is more than hydroxide, more than amine group, more than ketone group, more than ether group. Okay. So that means if I ask you, um, I give you three chemicals with this functional group, and I tell you which one has more solubility, you can just predict by this uh, formula or this. Uh, concept. Um, and I'll give you some quiz questions so that you know. Again, these are just repeat just to show. So now um, 
you might you know this just to highlight you now what are functional group basically anything that's not carbon and hydrogen so here for instance if you see um, um, dna structures you can see all these different functional group this is amine this is oxygen this is another amine group nh and then this is o uh, ether group this is phosphate this is a single nitrogen so as you see every time you have a nitrogen it's more electronegative than hydrogen so that means they can attract each other by hydrogen bonding okay um, because of difference in electronegativity and so that's how you see this is how the dna structure or the things are all uh, aligned together by hydrogen bonding um, and then i'll give you another example this is sugar uh, so sugar molecule has phosphate and then this has nitrogen base that's basically if you take one piece of dna so these are different functional group so each functional group can present or or change its properties certain way. So you got to think of that. Then this is a drug, you know, the, the nicotine, morphine, heroin, this is how they look, okay? So if I ask you where is the functional group, you can just uh, just uh, circle it. So if I ask how many functional group, you that could be one question in the midterm exam, you just have to uh, write it like this, okay? There are actually two here. So these are all functional group. And if I ask which one is form hydrogen bonding, if I give you this is CS3 versus NH2, you know that this is this can form hydrogen bonding. Cannot form H bond then you know that there is a um, reason for that right i see that somebody raised hand i don't see always so you can you can answer or you can ask question you can interrupt me without really raising hand um thank you should we consider the phenyl groups as functional groups uh phenyl means uh, oh or the the um like the like the benzene ring type things uh, no, so that's that's the organ that they said carbon and hydrogen. They are not functional group, they are hydrocarbons. Okay. So if you think of benzene, benzene is basically if I write this one, this is carbon. And then there is hydrogen, all that. Okay. So that's functional group will change CH, CH. So these are carbon and hydrogen, there is no other. So when I say functional group, that has to be oxygen, nitrogen, all these other forms, non-carbon and hydrogen, okay? Any of these elements present, that's a functional group, not hydrogen alone, not carbon alone. Thank you. Okay, uh, because that's hydrocarbon. CS3 is basically, if you add another hydrogen, it's methane. So they, I mean, they can be functional group. It's not like they cannot be, you know, it's just that they are not going to make, uh, they're going to, not going to form hydrogen bonding. Okay, they will just call as a branch. If that increase the molecular weight, that can make them more hydrophobic. So uh, if you have more CH3 or this kind of functional group, or not functional group, that chain, uh, it makes it more hydrophobic because it increases the number of carbon. All right, so I think let's take a break for 10 minutes. Um, five or 10, we'll be back. And then we'll discuss about this thermodynamic constant like Bol um, Henry constant, adjacent constant, all that to predict the pattern transport. So right now it's a five or two, so we'll be back in 512. So I'm gonna stop the recording. So before the break, we we learn what makes the chemical form hydrogen bonding, and if it makes um, it form hydrogen bonding, it has relevance for that it's going to be volatile or it's going to be uh, more water soluble or what are that factors. So that's all depends on structure or functional group. 
Now, you know, how do you know which is more volatile if you know the thermodynamic properties? So one way to find out is the Henry constant or a volatile constant. So basically if you, this is one of the, the <clears throat> if it is a volatilization is one way to find out. For instance, uh, if you put the gasoline in the container after a few days, you will not find any gasoline because all are escaped to air. So if it is pure liquid and it form pure gas, uh, that constant is K, you know? So that's basically how much it can evaporate from a pure liquid. But if it is already polluted in water, then how much fraction of that is going to get into air? That means, you know, that's a different constant that we call Henry constant. Here, this is not the pure liquid. This is basically contaminated liquid and looking at concentration of that liquid contaminant in air versus water. So as you see over here, this one is saying concentration of PC in gas, or uh, this is basically air, and concentration of PC in water. So that ratio is a gas, air to water ratio is a Henry constant. Well, a Henry constant can be reported in many different ways. It could be gas to water, or it could be water to gas. Uh, but if it is given um, uh, dimensionless form, you can read here, it says here, KAW. KW means uh, concentration in air versus concentration in water. If it is written K, KWA, that means this is concentration in water divided by concentration in air. <clears throat> so it all depends on how they write the coefficients. So the point here is that if you know this number, you know what concentration will be higher. In this case, it is KW. What does that mean? It's the ratio of concentration in air by concentration in water. That means if the KW is high, that means more likely stay in the air. That means more volatile. So this is, a, I gave you the example here. Uh, so as you see, whatever the number is much higher, that should be much highly volatile. As you see this number, these are all exponential, 10 to the power something. So that means uh, it's a negative term. So that means if the number is um, this number is lower, that means if the entire term is higher because this is one over 10 to the power 0 0.65. So that means if the exponent, if the exponent decreases, that means this whole term would increase. Okay. Uh, so that means this is the lowest value. That's the number. And as you see, based on the prediction of a um, functional group, this should be the highly volatile because it has the least number of carbon, it doesn't have any functional group. But if you compare with this versus that, the only difference is which, look at the number, how much it changed. It's changed by three order of magnitude. That means the concentration of phenol in air will be lot three order of magnitude lower than what you find concentration of benzene in the same conditions. Now, if you look for this one versus this, uh, the difference is it has only two carbon, but there's a lot of chlorine. Uh, so that's why you can see that number is, um, it has six carbon, it has two carbon. So there's a fraction there. Now compare benzene with uh, phenanthrene. You have a number here. As you see, phenanthrene has much more carbon. So that's why Henry constant actually becomes smaller. That means the air concentration will be two order magnitude lower. So in, in real world, if you have a project, you are actually looking for KS value. So you are, you are actually looking for K value and you look for online and you find that number and apply that. Uh, you cannot just say this is much higher than the other. That's for quiz. But for, for your projects, once you determine contaminants, you look for these properties. Um, can I ask you a question on that last slide that you were just on? Yeah. So if we see a, um, a W or WA, does that mean it's definitely a K sub H and not just a regular K? Um, so is this like how the, are you asking the question about notation? Because So on the slide just before this? Yes. You go back one. K, oh, I see. So you had a, a K with no sub H. So oh, I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, I don't think because there are lots of different K here, um, you should not, um, use just how the notation is to understand what kind of constant it is. 
it's written there it will write this is a ball this is a vapor pressure or it says a fan rate constant um, okay so i don't don't assume based on what is written k value because there are so many k's here for everything there is a k as you see in next couple of slide okay um again as i said increasing number of car if you decrease the number of carbon it's smaller and smaller it's more likely to be evaporated so that's one number and number two is the functional group so we had a couple of quiz question last class i just want to reiterate again these are the functional group that can form hydrogen bonding and if that functional group is present not this one but it does there is a different reason uh, for any functional group that will most likely make it low Uh, less volatile compared to just carbon and hydrogen, so that's why I say between those three, same functional group, you are just looking for a small number of carbon, so this is more volatile. And the, for the precipitations, it's the same thing. It's a basically where uh, more uh, more contaminants come come together and they bind with each other. That means they will precipitate. The, they will no longer be soluble. And so the pollutant that become more easy to precipitate. We are talking about precipitate means uh, they become salt, or they form solid, um, or they become pure compounds from water. They will not disperse in water, and that depends on if they don't like it to stay in water. So any anything which is less soluble is more likely to precipitate. Again, you can relate back what makes the compound more soluble: hydrogen bonding. So if you have any kind of functional group, it will be less likely to precipitate um, uh, at low concentrations. So that means, you know, so look for in this particular example. So what are the functional group that can form hydrogen bonding? For instance, if I show you this one, this is one functional group. This is another. This is another. It's another. It's another. These are all functional group that can form hydrogen bonding because nitrogen, hydrogen. Nitrogen, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. There is a carbon. This bond over here. Um, so because you have so much uh, organic here, or the functional group, you can predict that this will be very much soluble. Okay. So if it has high solubility, not precipitate. Same thing over here. Think of how many functional group there. Are. So any any volunteer identify functional group that can form hydrogen bonding. For this this one, let's look for how many at least. Anyone? Okay, somebody says O H. So I'm gonna. Okay, that's number one. C O H. Right, that's number two. Oh no, actually you say this one. Which is true. So this is actually OH. Okay. So this is OH. Okay. So this is what form functional group. So this is the OH fractions. And I already wrote this one. There is a one more. All right. Yes. NH. Because as I said, nitrogen, hydrogen is highly electronegative different. So that's why. Carbon, oxygen, very similar hydrogen, similar um, electronegativity. So that means they are not going to form hydrogen one. So you have two, three, four. Let's uh, try again. How many of you can detect in caffeine? Caffeine is what you drink in a coffee. Um. Right. So, where is that NH? There is no NH. It's just single nitrogen. CO. Uh, but as I said, CO is doesn't form hydrogen bonding because they are very similar electronegative. So that's why they will not form hydrogen bonding. Carbon, uh, oxygen, hydrogen has to be there. Okay, so there is no hydrogen here. Um, so there is none uh, here. But if we, if they if they bind some hydrogen and become NH plus, they might. Okay, uh, but not necessarily 
That means you need a protons to polarize it. It's very unlikely. What about here? Acetamorphine, that's the one which has a painkiller. So C, C double one O will not have because carbon hydroxygen oxygens are not very different in electron hydrogen. Not that much, it has to be very wide. So the key is hydrogen and another electronegative atom. Hydrogen with oxygen or hydrogen with nitrogen. All right, acetamorphin, can you identify a functional group and, and then also the, so yes, this is the functional group that can form hydrogen bonding. But if you ask me what is the other functional group there, that's the one, carbon oxygen, but it doesn't form hydrogen. So this is no H bond. This form H bond. <clears throat> okay. All right, vitamin D, vitamin D. So. Wait, I have a question about acetaminophen. Is okay. the uh, NH not a. Oh, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot this one. This is two. Okay, thank you. Right. I didn't even see that one. So you see that those are the functional group required for uh, for this to, to soluble in your body very quickly or not your body in the, the world. What about vitamin D? Can you identify functional group, which is, um, right, which so these are, again, these are hydrocarbon. We can call functional group, but these are basically long chain. And so those chains are makes it more hydrophobic. So because of that, now as you see, uh, if, you, if you remove this one, OH, it's not going to be soluble in water. Um, so, um, all right, so these are some example I saw you. Um, but if you, if you talk in terms of just pure chemist, Everything is a branch is a functional group. CS3 is a methyl group, all that factor. Just for you know solubility contest, I'm just focusing on everything hydrogen bonding. All right, so now you have a better idea of you know what makes the structure more soluble or not. So I wrote all these solute like a summary that we have covered before. So you should be able to uh, cover that one. So now hold on, let me see what's the going on here. Yeah, do not disturb me when I'm working. All right, so this question again before we had it, uh, so I'm just going to uh, write it again here. Now we, we covered this one multiple times. Uh, oil spill occur, you know, which one of them would be present in higher concentration in groundwater? So we're looking for which has more solubility. And again, between those two, the difference is this, and that's the one for hydrogen bonding, so answer would be this. Uh, if an oil spill contains the following chemical, which one of them would be present in higher concentration in groundwater? So now I gave you another, I think I had this question before, but um, just for sake of it, let's have a poll. Um, between this, which one will have higher concentration in groundwater? Your choice is obviously, you know, you, you can rule out B because the B doesn't have hydrogen bonding, okay? So the higher concentration in groundwater means it's more, more water soluble. Means it has to have functional group that makes it water soluble. More carbon, not water soluble. Less carbon, water soluble. So between B and A and all this factor, you can see that B has more carbon and no functional group. Between A and C, you have to pick a number. All right, so I'm gonna close the poll now. And I'm gonna share the results. So this will give you an idea of the quiz next, next class, you know, because I'm gonna just give you similar, very similar questions.
so the answer, as you see, uh, most of you uh, uh, chose C. Uh, the reason, the that's the correct answer. And let's think of why. As I said, the number of carbon increases, solubility would decrease. And um, so between these, look at number of carbon. This is one, two, three, four, five. So this is five carbon. This is six carbon, six carbon. So that means between this, you already know that you now the less number of carbon is more soluble. But that's not the only condition. You have to also see hydrogen bonding. That's more likely make it soluble. Five versus six, not much difference uh, if you have a functional group. So between these two, you know that this, uh, this can form hydrogen bonding. So that means you would choose A if there is nothing else is given and B. But now between A and C, both have functional group. The difference is C has less carbon. That means it's more likely to be soluble in water and not stick with soil. So that's why the answer is C. Because so you're looking for soil, water, I didn't tell anything about air here. Um, so, but if it even air, you can still predict it like that. <clears throat> All right, so you got an idea of that before. Now let's think of the sorption. Sorption means once you have a spill, most of the pollutant will stick with the soil and remaining of them will go with the water. So we call that sorption. The reason is could be adsorption or absorption. The difference is Absorption means you know it is on the surface, it stick on the surface of the soil. Absorption means it goes inside the pore. Uh, but again, there is no fundamental difference between absorption and adsorption because still ultimately it's a surface active process. Whether that surface is right in the surface or inside the inside the you know in, internal area, that's difference. But the reaction, the process, the thermodynamics is still, still the same. So that's why people don't want to define it as an adsorption or absorption, they call it sorption. And it can occur for both uh, water, you know, uh, it can occur for any many kind of pollutants, both gaseous phase as, as well as liquid phase. All right, so why it is important? As I said, this class is about remediation to some extent. So you wanted to know a lot of times how the extent of pollutions at a site. For instance, in the example, you have a source dry cleaning facility here, and groundwater is moving these directions. So these pollutants are moving in these directions. So if you know, if the soil is very highly absorbing, that means those pollutants will be removed from uh, water. That means not going, the plume is not going to migrate as fast as possible uh, because of that absorption. So you want to know the, how much is going to stick with the soil. And second kind of application is a remediation design. For instance, if you want to remove some pollutants using a pump and treat method, which is what is the case here, you pump the contaminated water and then you um, let it pass through an activated carbon tank or any kind of adjacent media. And then clean water is going to inject back into the ground. Uh, so that's again, what kind of materials you'll use, how efficient it will be, all depends on absorption. And so this is again, as I said, adsorption on activated carbon is what we are going to use. And um, you are going to look for how long it takes for activated carbon is going to, uh, before it is going to be exhausted, all that can, you can calculate if you know this concept. So this is the theory behind those design. So what I'm going to cover today is just a little bit theory. Next class, we are going to apply that concept uh, for design. Um, so now, Again, as I said, this is also a thermodynamic constant. What does that mean? Is you will all, for each pro, each particular pollutant, there is a constant that can predict how much of those pollutant will absorb in soil or any materials. So that's what we call again another K. Um, KD is partition coefficients, and which is basically um, is a ratio. Or it's a best. what it means that if you if you have a any solid, let's say this is contaminated water, okay? Water, and you have these pollutants. Now what you do is if you if you put a solid, okay, this is solid, some of the pollutants is going to absorb. And if you mix them together for a while, 
then you'll see that you know, if you start with, let's say, uh, concentration initial, let's say 100 milligram per liter. And if you mix them with the solid after like certain time when there is no change in concentration, you, you mix it and you take some sample, you find, you find that this concentration is decreasing. It's always going to be less than what you initially start with because start absorbing on the solid. So after a point, you will see that that concentration doesn't change. That means, you know, whatever that can come that already have absorbed on the surface. Uh, so that means there is equilibrium between how much a, uh, of a pollutant that can absorb based on how much in the water. And that force that make them not, every pollutant absorb on the system is called thermodynamic principle of absorption. So that constant is Kd. And this Kd usually for a linear absorption is concentration of contaminant in water by concentration in solid. If it is linear absorption, if it's non-linear, we'll get to that. But this is basically all that means is what is that partitioning force that prevent or that determine how much a pollutant that can absorb um, on, a, on a contaminated or on a solid media. So this KD, as I said, um, this is we call isotherm, means this is determined at a constant temperature and the entire reaction has to be done at a constant temperature uh, because if you increase temperature or decrease temperature, that absorption will change. So we call that isotherm because this temperature is constant when you, uh, when you determine KD. That means K is a function of temperatures. Okay, or I'm going to write KT. That, that means if you if you are determining K value or measuring, you have to uh, keep the temp temperature constant. If you increase the temperature, there will be different KD. So even though I say it's a constant, doesn't mean that it's a constant with respect to temperature. It's just constant at that, uh, for that contaminants at a specific temperature and pressure. So that's the key. Um, so now, you know, as I said, a linear adjustment, which is very much likely you'll use in any groundwater pollution, I'll get to that why, uh, but that's the reason, C soil equal to KD times C water. We learned that in the C153, and then we have other two type of non-linear adjustment. Uh, basically, what this means is that linear adjustment means if your contaminant concentration in water increases, your contaminant concentration in soil also increase proportionally. That means, you know, it can be different slope. This slope. So this is C soil. So that this slope is KD. So if the slope is higher, that means, you know, for the same pollutant, more amount is absorbed on the soil. Um, so that's the linear absorption. That means you know the, if you if the capacity of a substance is higher. That's not true in nature. You know there is not infinite capacity. All it means that the concentration range where you are where you are interested to understand the absorption is very low enough to not to saturate the substance. So that's mostly applied for groundwater uh, and some pollutants. But when you think of treatment, you are removing lots of pollutant in the solid. And that's the time your contaminant concentration is usually very high and because you are constantly exposed to that substance. So that in that cases, most of the time your this linear adjustment fails. What you do is you use non-linear adjustment, which basically the concentration, if you increase the concentration of contaminant in water, concentration in the solid will dis disproportionately increase. It will increase but different way. So that means you know, if you plot this value, that's basically like this. That means non-linear, that's what you call. What it does, it could be like this or it could be like this. So this is linear. This is, these two are non-linear. Um, so that's basically, this is called friend leak. It means that you know, as you increase the, uh, as you increase the concentration, less and less will absorb or more can absorb based on other factors, but this is the factor. And um, then there is another one which is called Langmuir. The difference between friend leak and Langmuir, which I wrote here, is that friend leak, everything will absorb on the surface and there will be more absorption on top of that. 
Whereas Langmuir, it's a monolayer adsorption. Means once it's occupied in the surface, there will be no more adsorption. Typically for gas, that's what occurs because one gas molecule attached, it will block the entire other sides. Um, so again, for you, it doesn't really matter. Just know that these are the difference in concept. And Langmuir, if you if you put if you if you plot Langmuir, it look like this. It means after a point, you cannot adsorb anymore. So this is a complete saturation. So it predict adsorption for a contaminant, which is very you know it can be saturated uh, very quickly. Whereas friendly, it's going to be like you know this portion can be friendly. Okay, so that means if you go like it can go much longer, but it just become more and more expensive or it become more less and less efficient for as increased concentrations. Again, why we are interested in learning this one is, is where you are going to apply this concept. When you design a project, if you are doing activated carbon adsorption, you are most likely use Langmuir or Friendly. But if you are looking for you know, contamination extent in groundwater, the concentration is very low. Uh, so you may be using linear adsorption. Um, so how do you determine what to use? Basically, if you, you know C, CW versus C soil, and you should be linearize it and see whichever is the great fit. So the way to linearize is basically log C soil K plus log CW one over N. So that means this is, if you plot this is Y, this is log CW is X, this will be M, this is a constant. So. So this is y, this is x, and this is slope. The intercept is um, so that means you can um, if you if you write if you plot this one, you will be able to um, see what is the r square. Then you'll be able to use it. What about this particular one? If it's Langmuir, this also you have to linearize it. The way to linearize if you do one over soil would be one, one over C soil um, max B. Um, this will be, so this is CW. So that will be um, <clears throat> one over C soil max, okay. So that means if you plot this one, this is as y. So this is intercept, this is slope. So if you plot one over um, C soil or C one over the reciprocal, then you get a straight line. Then from the slope, you can calculate all that. Uh, and this is, then see what is the best fit and based on that you can predict. So again, these are all we cover in CC, uh, not, uh, this, whatever I'm gonna cover now. Uh, for soil, you basically use KD. KD means uh, a linear adsorption, and that's related to adsorption to soil organic carbon. So KD is uh, this usually fraction of organic carbon, fraction of organic times KOC. KOC is basically affinity of that pollutants towards the organic carbon. The reason you use this assumption is because um, the adsorption only occur towards the organic in some, some contaminants. They don't attach to inorganic form. So that's why there is, you don't have to account for an inorganic part of the soil. So you're just looking for how much organic, based on that you can predict. The challenge here is that the KOC is basically the affinity of that contaminants towards organic and that usually um, depends on what type of organic in soil. And as I see, if I take a soil here, this is a different organic, this is a wood that has different organic. And then you have some kind of, uh, let's say black color stuff that has a different organic structure. So that means the adsorption could be very different based on what type of organic is. So that means how do you calculate KOC? KOC is impossible to calculate if, you, if the organic matter uh, property change over time 
or even uh, based on different locations. So that's why in, in, in this class or in most of the time, people look for a very standard organic carbon and then they measure that constant. And in this case, we call that octanol. So this is our, instead of KOC, they calculate K adsorption to octanols. So that means if you know how much a contaminant adsorbed to octanol, which is another organic, octanol means eight carbons, single chain, uh, then you can predict, that way you can compare between different pollutants. So that's the only reason you mix that together and that's how you work. So this is just example I show you, seed water and this is isotherm and you, you calculate all this KOC value and um, then you can use it. So why I'm telling you all this? A lot of times if you know a contaminants, you have to find this KOW or KD value uh, to predict this uh, removal or predict this transport. And this value will not be given in, in one form. You may find in KOW, then you have to predict, you have to calculate KD based on KOW. So KD is directly proportional to KOC and it's directly proportional to KOW. So if you know one of them, you can able to calculate KD. And these are usually experimentally determined. That's how we can calculate. So this is just an example to show you. These are adsorption isotherm curve. And then I say what chemical that will be relatively easier to remove by activated carbon. That means whichever has more KD or more slope, that will be easier to remove. So as you see, this is the slope here. This is another slope. So that means the KD value roughly at low concentrations, you have more pollutant can be removed. But again, um, I'm sorry, this is molecular weight. So molecular weight or what? Let me see what this concentration are. KD value is this. Basically, wherever the highest KD value, that will be easier to remove. So that means wherever the maximum number. Okay, this is molecular weight. This is not water concentrations. So you're basically looking for it. The KD is high absorption will be high, that means removal will be high. Okay. All right, so um, just the last final quiz, you know, just to see which one um, uh, I'm going to, this is just the right final poll before we leave. Let me explain the question. The figure describes the isotherm of three chemical, A, B, C, on the activated carbon. Which chemical would be very difficult to remove at low concentrations? Means, think of this is the low concentrations. Which one will be difficult to remove? So that means, you know, um, the adsorption or the amount absorbed on activated carbon will be very less at low concentrations. So this is the concentration in water. This is concentration in activated carbon, solid. So wherever the concentration is higher, that is easier to remove. So pick, pick one location and see which one has more Q. That's the one easier to remove. All right, this is one minute, so I'm gonna end the poll. Okay, share the results. So which chemical would be difficult to remove? The answer is C, okay? The reason is if you draw here, straight line, at that concentration, this is the concentration in water, the amount that goes to soil or the activated carbon is this for C. For B, this much amount go. For A, this much amount goes. So that means if for the same container concentration, you have more amount goes to the activated carbon if it is a chemical A. So that's how you can predict. All right, so another question. A waste tank containing the following three chemicals are spilled on ground. The figure describes the partitioning of chemical in soil as a function of equilibrium concentrations. 
um, in groundwater. Which contaminant is more likely to travel fast in groundwater? That means which one is less likely to absorb? That's opposite to the last questions. So what is given is isotherm. So look for which one is less likely to absorb. It means uh, the concentration of pollutant in soil will be less. That means they're more likely to stay in wherever the KD is low. You have 10 more seconds to answer. Again, just uh, whatever comes to your mind. Two more seconds, I'll close the quiz. All right, so let's see, share the results. Um, most of you chose C, let's look for what is the C. So C is this, so that is C, okay? Um, and this is B, the circle is B, this, this triangle, so this is A. So let's draw this one. You know. If you pick wherever the KD, so think of what is KD. KD is the slope of a linear adsorption. So wherever the slope is low. So if you see, this one is higher slope. So that means C, KD is highest. Where KD is lowest, the A value, because that's the lowest slope. KD. So if you think of that way, if the KD is lowest, that means the adsorption is less. If adsorption is less, it's going to travel fast in groundwater because it's not going to be removed. So that means the answer would be A. Professor, I think you uh, flipped A. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. So I, the symbol is very bad. So that's, I'm saying it right way, but I, when I see the symbol, then I realize I'm flipping it everything. So you're right. So this is, else what's what happened? Okay, so this is, uh, this one is um, A, this is B, this is C. Yeah, C is the lowest. So that means this is the, Okay, so what you learned so far is that if you have um, uh, more organic carbon, uh, if you have more organic carbon in soil, it will absorb more pollutant. If you have more carbon, the high KD value, then that means uh, it's going to stick with soil more. Uh, so learn, you learn how to use KD because now you know how to interpret isotherm and then based on that, you'll be able to predict. So next class, we'll apply this concept. This is again background. Will accept the. Uh, will apply this concept to actually predict the plume transport. Again, this is something you learn in C one fifty three. So you'll uh, you'll just learn uh, relearn again uh, how they are removing. How you can uh, solve the big uh, homework questions. So I'll release the homework tonight. Uh, again, this is not due until next Thursday. Second homework, um, but that will be mostly on groundwater pollutions. All right, so that's all for this today. Any questions? We are two minutes um, already past time. All right, so see you on next class. I'll release again a quiz. You can ask any questions related to quiz until next class, okay? Once I release the questions, I'll not answer related topics on that. Um, so keep asking and these are all questions you can follow through again, just to see if you, if you can answer all the quiz in this, uh, in example quiz, you should be able to answer 99% quiz in the, in the real exams. Cause I just changed a couple of question here and there, just a same concept. Okay. All right. See you then. Thank you.